Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messier, and you're probably wondering what happened to my beard. Well, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of good Halloween costumes that I can do that include a beard, so every year my face tends to make the ultimate sacrifice in the name of the Halloween spirit. And since you're probably going to ask, here for your viewing pleasure is yours truly as Agatha Christie's Hercule Poirot. Anyway, today we're going to be looking at something that might look a little familiar. So you'll recall that quite a few months ago, I did a video on one of these. This is an SCR578 Gibson Girl survival radio, and this is carried in aircraft survival kits during the Second World War. Now, I thought that video was pretty comprehensive, but unfortunately I didn't have access to a lot of the accessories that the Gibson Girl would have been supplied with. So I had to show photos and diagrams and things like that. But I was looking through the collection of the Royal Aviation Museum of Western Canada, where I now work, and I came across this. This is a complete Gibson Girl kit along with the drop bag and all of the various accessories. And I thought, I think it's time for a do-over of that video because this stuff is just really, really neat. Now, this video will nominally supersede the older one, but since in the previous video I did cover uh, some later developments, some of the more modern VHF transmitters, I'm going to leave that one up, and if you're interested in those later developments, you can definitely check that one out. This video is going to be focusing almost exclusively on the Gibson Girl itself, and primarily its accessories package. Now, before we have a closer look at all this stuff, just a little bit of background. Now, the Gibson Girl was a development of an older German design for an emergency radio called the NS2 Notsender. And this was introduced in the Luftwaffe in the mid-1930s. And it introduced this hourglass-shaped case. And the purpose of this is to allow the radio to be more easily used in a life raft. The idea is that you can hold the radio more securely between your legs while you power the radio using a hand crank. Now, in the mid-1930s, batteries were pretty heavy and bulky. They were prone to leakage and draining. And so if you tried to make an emergency transmitter using batteries, it would be very heavy and unwieldy, especially on a life raft. And also you ran the risk of opening up your transmitter and trying to power it up and seeing that the batteries were dead. So having it hand powered allowed it to be a lot lighter and more compact and more reliable. Now, early in the Second World War, the British captured an example of the NS2 off of a crashed German aircraft and thought it was such a great idea they decided to produce their own copy, the T-1333. Now, whereas the NS-2 had a case that was hourglass shaped like this, the T-1333 had a rectangular case but used triangular pads to achieve the same effect. Now, in 1941, the design was copied yet again by the Bendix Corporation in the United States to produce the SCR-578 Gibson Girl. And this proved superior to its predecessors and quickly became the standard emergency radio for the Allied forces for the remainder of the war. Now, while at the end of the war, this was starting to be superseded by uh, more advanced VHF transmitters, they did remain in widespread use after the war. In fact, uh, they were used in both uh, civilian and in military circles well into the 1960s. So, without further ado, let's go in a little bit closer and see how this actually works. So here we have the actual Gibson Girl radio itself. Now, the nickname for this comes from the American illustrator Charles Dana Gibson, whose illustrations of these highly idealized, very curvy women, which became known as Gibson Girls, were these style icons and sex symbols in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So this is very similar to pilots naming their inflatable life vests, after the very curvaceous Mae West. So, as I said before, the reason for this shape is to allow you to grip the radio between your knees in a life raft, and this strap right here would have wrapped around the bottom of your legs in order to further secure the radio in place as you operated the hand-cranked generator. Now, you'll notice that the crank is missing here. This is because, in storage, the crank would have been stored in this special slot in the back here. So, to remove that, you just pull out this pin, 
out comes the handle. It's got its little lanyard here to prevent it from falling out the side of the life raft. And then you put that in this little square slot at the top, screw down the threaded knob, and then you're ready to go. Now this had to be cranked at a minimum of 80 RPM in order to properly power the transmitter. And there's a little indicator lamp right here that glows when you've reached the proper RPM. Uh, there's a second indicator lamp here, and that's to indicate that you've actually tuned the radio to the correct frequency. And this was designed to transmit at 500 kilohertz, which was the standard emergency frequency at the time. And it did this using a pair of vacuum tubes. Uh, previous transmitters like the NS2 and the T1333 used crystal oscillators. So there's a number of different ways of sending a signal using the Gibson Girl. The first is manually using this little signal key right here. You can tap that and transmit any message you want in Morse code while you're cranking the generator. But there's also a selector knob right here that allows you to choose between two pre-selected signal chains. Uh, so this has a little cam mechanism in it uh, that's powered by the crank, sort of like a music box. And this sends a continuous stream of either an SOS, dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, 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 or the letter A, dot, dash, dot, dash, dot, dash. Uh, there's a third way to send a signal with this, actually, which is to send a light signal. And the kit came with a little signal lamp. And I'll open that up for you right now so you can see. And that would have plugged in to this little socket in the front. You then change the knob to light. And as you're cranking, this will power the light and you can use your signal key here to send a flashing Morse signal using the lamps. This is when a rescue aircraft or a ship comes close enough to make visual contact. Now, there's a number of other accessories and features here. Number one, we have our antenna compartment in the front here. So you just pull out this pin and that opens up and you have a spool in there with 60 meters or 200 feet of copper wire. And that antenna could be held up in a number of ways, which we'll look at in a second. And finally, we have our ground. So you just unscrew this knob right here and you'll see there's a lead weight with a section of copper cable. And that would actually be thrown overboard onto the side of the raft and it would ground or earth the circuit to the very conductive seawater. So let's have a look at some of the accessories that came with the Gibson Girl radio. Now the transmitter had an effective range of 320 kilometers, but in order to transmit that far, you need to extend the 60 meter antenna to its full length. And there were two ways of doing this. On a windy day, you would use this, a folding box kite. And let me show you how that goes together. So it comes in two sections. You pull this out, you can see it's cloth on aluminum struts. So this unfolds like this, and you force it down in the middle. It's a little bit unwieldy. I can't really imagine doing this aboard a life raft, but eventually it does come together. Like so. One section. See if I can do this one faster. Anyway, through the magic of editing, here's the second section, and then they simply slot together like so, and you have a box kite. And then included among the accessories is an extra spool of antenna wire in case the main one breaks, as well as a wrench, which is used to loosen some of the storage caps in case they become frozen shut. So one end is to remove the cap over the well for the hand crank. The other one is to remove the cap over the ground. And then there's also a slot here, which allows you to uh, adjust the braking tension on the spool of antenna wire so let's say if you get a big gust of wind that carries off your kite, you don't snap the line. You can actually adjust the speed at which the antenna pays out. 
So under normal circumstances, you would have enough wind at sea level in order to launch your kite up to the altitude you need to fully pay out your antenna. However, there are sometimes conditions where there is no wind at sea level and a stronger wind up at higher altitude. And the British version of this type of radio system, the T1333, included a rather unique solution to this problem. You could actually launch the kite using a rocket fired out of a flare pistol or very pistol, which would have been included in every aircraft survival kit. Uh, this particular one is a Webley and Scott number no. three Mark I. I might do a video on flare pistols later on. This one's interesting because the rear half of it, the grip and the action, is basically a Webley and Scott Mark VI revolver. Only the front half is specially built as a flare pistol. Unfortunately, the Gibson Girl, the American version of this radio system, did not include the rocket launch capability for the kite. You had to wait for conditions where you had enough wind at sea level in order to have a successful launch. But what do you do if it's a calm day and you have no wind to launch a box kite with? Well, thankfully, the Gibson Girl comes packed with an alternative solution, which is to launch the antenna using a hydrogen-filled balloon. So each Gibson Girl came packed with two of these canisters, each of which contains one latex balloon around one meter in diameter. And to use this, you would take the key at the top of the can, and just like with a can of sardines, open it up, pull out the balloon, and if the balloon is frozen, say you're floating around in the North Atlantic and it's very cold, you then want to warm up that balloon prior to inflation. It's natural latex, it gets brittle when it's cold, and if you try to unfold it while it's still frozen, it may crack and then you won't be able to fill it. So the instruction manual for the Gibson Girl gives instructions to take the balloon and say stick it in your jacket under your armpit and warm it up until it's flexible enough to inflate. And to inflate the balloon, you would use one of these. Uh, this is a chemical hydrogen generator, and what this is is a metal canister filled with lithium hydride, which, when mixed with seawater, produces hydrogen gas. And to use that, you again pull out this key, open up the top of the can, open up the bottom of the can, whereupon an inner sleeve will drop out and lock into place. You then go to that same yellow sleeve that contained the kite, and you pull out one of these. This is an inflator tube. You then screw that into a threaded receptacle at the top of the can, and then immerse the entire thing in water off the side of the life raft. It will then start to produce that chemical reaction and hydrogen gas. You then put the neck of the balloon over top of this end of the inflator tube, and it will start to fill with gas. And once it's filled, you tie it off and attach the antenna to the balloon, let it go, and it will deploy your antenna. Now, the reaction that produces the hydrogen gas also produces a significant amount of heat, so you had to be careful to handle this thing using the wooden handle on the inflator tube, otherwise you could either burn yourself or, considerably worse, uh, damage the rubber on the life raft and cause yourself to sink. So finally, we have the protective bag that the Gibson Girl and all of its accessories would have been stored in. And as you can see, it's made out of very heavy-duty rubberized canvas to waterproof it. It's got thick padding, this felt material on the inside to protect the radio and its electronics from shock. It's got heavy webbing on the outside with plenty of handholds. This could be easily manhandled, pulled aboard the life raft. It also has two anchor points on the top for attaching a parachute. So while this was carried aboard aircraft themselves, so bombers and maritime patrol aircraft for use if they crashed in the ocean, it could also be carried by rescue aircraft, say a PBY Catalina, a short Sunderland, a B-17, uh, and American services were typically known as Dumbo missions. And if they spotted a downed air crew in their life raft who didn't have a radio, they could then airdrop this entire kit to them so they could establish communication and coordinate a rescue and actually happened to have the parachute that this would have used. And this has two carabiners on it, and those would just clip in to these two shackles here. You could then take the whole thing, throw it out of an aircraft, and it would land in the water and float, and it could be picked up by a downed aircrew. Now, you'll probably notice this weird little bump, this little tent on the top of the flap. Uh, this is actually to accommodate the sleeve containing the kite and the inflator tubes. I'll show you a cutaway diagram at how this was supposed to be packed. Apparently they couldn't figure out a way of fitting everything into a plain rectangular bag without wasting space, so they just made this little extra piece at the top here 
for when the kite poked out. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Uh, it was really fun being able to pick through this kit and look at the actual accessories that the Gibson girl would have come with rather than just having to describe them to you. And this really satisfies uh, a part of my brain that loves kits, especially old complete kits that have survived the passage of time. I don't know what it is, but it's just super satisfying. And I hope it is for you as well. And being able to go through the museum collection and pick out rare gems like this to show to you is really one of the many perks of the job, and I absolutely love it. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities right here on Our Own Devices. Have a great day.